very exciting, very exciting. Thank you so much for being willing to, to give that lecture. So I'm just gonna provide a brief introduction and then we'll get started. So Dr. Uh, Jennifer Davidson is Associate Professor of Worship and Theology at American Baptist Seminary of the West. And she's a member of the core doctoral faculty at the Graduate Theological Union, where she's taught since 2007. She is also chair of the Women's Studies and Religion Certificate Program at GTU. She received her PhD in Liturgical Studies and Systematic and Philosophical Theology from GTU and an MDiv from Lutheran Theological Seminary at Philadelphia, and a BA in English and Secondary Education from Eastern University. Jennifer serves on the Commission for Doctrine and Christian Unity of the Baptist World Alliance, and chaired the Theolog Theologians Commission for the American Baptist Churches from 2011 to 2016. Jennifer brings a deep and abiding interest in lived spirituality, seeking to cultivate attentiveness to God's presence in everyday life. It is out of this spirituality that she seeks to live out her commitments to social justice, liberative contemplative education, and engaged scholarship. Her recent publications include the article Solidarity of Black Lives Matter in Trump America, How a Constructive Theology Classroom Can Speak to Our World's Need for Meaning and Connection, and a chapter entitled I Hate, I Despise Your Festivals, a Praxis-Oriented Liturgical Spirituality published in the book Trouble the Water, a Christian resource for the work of racial justice. She is completing her first book, River of Life, Feast of Grace, Baptism, Communion, and the Life of Radical Discipleship, to be published by Judson Press. Jennifer has been married for 25 years to Doug Davidson. Thanks for being here. A longtime editor uh, for The Other Side magazine and for book publishers such as Youth Specialties, Alvin Institute, Judson Press, and Zonderbank. Doug is currently Director of Communications at GTU, many of us will know that. <laughs> Together they have a son, Elliot, who's 20, who is completing his Associate's Degree in Psychology this month from Diablo Valley Community College. Oh. And uh, will be transferring in the fall to the University of Nevada in Reno to study Strategic Communications. Jennifer has taught the Women's Studies and Religion Required Seminar for GTU five times since 2010. I know that several of us have had the great privilege of being in that class. And she will be speaking to us today about that course and the ways that she seeks to allow the pedagogy itself to be an integral part of the course experience. So welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hello, everyone. It's wonderful to see so many familiar faces, and especially those of you. Um, I mean, it's wonderful to see all of you. <laughs> <laughs> and it's really neat to see those of you who have been in the women's studies class with me um, and uh, you have been such a part of what I'll be talking about um, and I've been thinking of you uh, and others who have been a part of the class a lot in these last um, few days as I've been preparing for this conversation. Um, as we begin, uh, I would like you to, I've passed around and Cheryl has a few extra, and oh, I actually have the extra on the poetry. We're going to do a little poetry exercise. Uh, over the next five minutes or so, um, those of you who have been in my class know exactly what's going on in this moment. Uh, if there are not <coughs> enough to go around, this is the form we're going to use. Um, but here are some extras if you do not have them. We're going to take five minutes and write a syncane. And actually, Cheryl, I do need one of those. Because that's um, and I, I can write the words up here, too. A syncane is a 22-syllable poem consisting of five unrhymed lines. So first line has two syllables, second four, six syllables, eight syllables, and two syllables. The themes I would like to inspire your poetry uh, are around these ideas. Telling my story, risk-taking in the classroom, brave space, body matters, ask the other question, work in progress, and speaking for or speaking with. Okay. So if one of those phrases grabs you, use that to start your poem. Uh, if it reminds you of something else, um, just start writing about that. Or if you come into the space with something particularly in, on your mind, then write your poem on that. All right. So five minutes. 
And those of us who are live streaming, the instructions are here on the board behind me, and I encourage you to do this practice as well. to write a poetry, I didn't call it this order, mm -hmm. but uh, my own I created. Great. My, daughter, my life is a gift of God. I am created in His own image. I long for His love day and night. I seek His face in every reality. I find Him in myself, others, and in creation. Mm -hmm. So this is how we start our women's studies classes uh, after a few weeks of being together. Mm -hmm. um, I usually in my plain old seminary classes at American Baptist Seminary of the West, uh, we start with some form of prayer. Um, most often it's a form of contemplative prayer uh, that is accompanied by the reading of scripture, uh, sometimes viewing videos or listening to music, uh, that kind of thing. But especially for a course that's being offered at the GTU, um, I, I want to start with a centering moment, uh, but don't want to start with prayer together because we all come from so many different traditions. So when I was starting to teach women's studies and religion, uh, I started by um, playing, well, the first week, I started by reading a poem. Uh, and I thought, reading a poem, because poetry is such a, 
important part uh, to uh, women's, the women's movement sort of over time. Uh, so <coughs> we started by reading a poem the first week. The second week I thought, well, I don't want all of the poetry to be conveyed in my own voice. <laughs> Um, so, even if I'm choosing different authors, if I'm the one who's reading it, I'm shaping how it's heard. So, the next couple weeks, I chose poetry that I could find on YouTube uh, and played the video of the author of the poem performing their own poem or spoken word piece uh, and did that for a couple weeks. Around the fourth week, when I was thinking about what poem to use, it occurred to me, with a little small sense of terror, <laughs> that I was going to ask the class to write their own poetry instead. It was um, a spontaneous um, thing that occurred to me, um, and I followed it. I followed the instinct, even though I was afraid that what I would be doing is putting my students in a really uncomfortable place. Um, and I'm sure I offered one apology as I did it, but not, I tried not to offer too many. Um, and I chose a very rigid form like this uh, because I felt like <coughs> if it was wide open, it would be, someone would just sit there and say, I don't know what to do, I don't write poetry, I don't know how to do this. Um, but by providing a really strict form, it immediately gives people access into the process. Uh, and then just decided after that first time that we were going to keep doing that. So each week I would select the certain themes that were present in the really heady theoretical uh, essays that we were reading. Mm -hmm. And I would pull phrases or themes out of those essays and let those be the inspiration point for the poems. And I think what students found that first year that I did it and then the subsequent uh, three or four years that I've done it that way is that something generative happens when a really heavy theoretical text uh, connects to another part of the brain or the spirit and gets turned into some kind of form of poetry. Um, it seemed to allow students to um, integrate what they had read on a theoretical level into their own experience uh, and connect it with things that they were thinking about that maybe they didn't even realize they were thinking about mm -hmm. until they sat down and spontaneously wrote the poem. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and those of you who were in the class um, can, can also sort of add to this, but my sense was that as the semester moved along and we began to read the poetry aloud that we had shared, um, trust began to build among the group um, in a way that just talking about these articles um, on their own would not necessarily do. There was a certain level of vulnerability that people engaged in to do this process. Um, and, uh, and the reward was sort of amazing. I think every year there was always at least one student in the class who said, I never, ever would have thought of myself as a poet. Mm -hmm. um, and then who left the class saying, uh, I, I can do this, you know, I, I love this, actually. Um, the first year that I tried this experiment, one of those students who came in not feeling like she was a poet ended up writing her final paper uh, in poetry. Her final, her final project was 
a collection of poems, some of the ones that she had written in class, mm -hmm. and some of the ones, some of them she wrote uh, outside of class, but connected to the themes that we were talking about in class. And then uh, she did the most clever thing by um, footnoting, having these lengthy footnotes, which were commentary back on her own poems. Um, so she actually created a, like a multi-layered um, uh, essay in some ways, where she, she wrote out some in prose in below the surface in the footnotes, uh, but kept the poetry as the substance of the paper. Um, it was so moving when I read it that I ended up writing my comments back to her in poetry. Mm -hmm. uh, because it, that's what it generated for me. Um, so this, I just wanted to share this, and last year we, our group published, and, and this year um, we'll be doing the same thing, uh, published the book of our poetry mm -hmm. at the end of the semester. Uh, and I think, Carolyn, it was you who came up with the title, As We Begin. Mm -hmm. um, I think so. <laughs> when, I turned, when I passed it around, I just sort of had title goes here. And it's like, I don't know what we should call this. And, um, and I think it was Carolyn who said, well, why don't we call it As We Begin? Because that's what we do every week as we begin. Um, and I just loved the the double meaning of the as we begin, um, or the multiple meanings of the as we begin as the, the collection. So I'm hoping <coughs> as we talk today, I'm gonna every now and then pick out some of the poems. Um, and they're, they're more heavy toward the ones that I wrote because although I have permission to share these, I also just wasn't sure how people would feel about me sharing them. So the first one that I'll share, <coughs> I, have, I had a, cold a few weeks ago, and it affects my asthma, so my coughing, I'll just be coughing, but I can breathe, I'm okay. <laughs> <laughs> so the first poem uh, that I'll share is Sin Cain, and it's entitled Chosen, and I wrote this one. Seems I choose these messy things like women's studies and religion. <laughs> or maybe they choose me. So I start out with that poem because teaching women's studies and religion is one of the messiest things I think to do. Um, the field itself is this really conflicted field. It holds a lot of tension within itself. Um, and uh, it involves minds, bodies, spirits. Uh, it involves um, economics and sociology and psychology and um, lived experience and religion and all of the complicating factors of religion um, and uh, gender and how gender is constructed and race and ethnicity and nations and how nations are formed and power uh, and um, it's just it's it's kind of, it's a stressful thing to, to teach <laughs> and people need to bring their full selves um, to the work uh, and Oftentimes, I think the easiest thing in the world would be for me to not be involved with this and to not teach it um, and to choose something that I feel like I can just focus much more clearly on um, that doesn't make me feel vulnerable and doesn't, like, where my students maybe don't feel quite as vulnerable as well. Uh, so, um, but I think it's also chosen me, uh, and I'm not sure I couldn't. Uh, I'm not sure I could walk away from it. So with that said, uh, I have passed around, and some of you may need to share, um, copies of the syllabus. Um, for better or worse, uh, this is a little dangerous to do because reviewing this, a syllabus is always the deadliest part of the first day of class. Um, but I, 
I thought we might kind of start here and, and feel free to interrupt, ask questions. Those of you who have been in class, feel free to, um, to add something as it occurs to you. I am sort of conceiving of this more as a conversation than as a straight out lecture. Um, but I wanted to uh, just kind of look, have us use the syllabus as a bit of a guide for the conversation itself. Um, and the first thing that I'll point us to are the, the texts that we read, and I brought the, the books up here um, to, to show you. The first is uh, the really, the much, um, I'm sorry, um, a very uh, heavy theoretical book, feminist, literally, it is heavy. <laughs> <laughs> Feminist theory reader, local and global perspectives. Um, I believe this is, yeah, fourth edition. Uh, and it is written most, mostly in a chronological kind of order uh, in some ways, uh, both chronological and thematically arranged. Um, and one of the challenges, I think, in teaching women's studies and you might also find this in teaching theology as well, um, is to teach something that is simultaneously chronologically ordered, while at the same time it is not a linear thing. So uh, what, gets, what qualifies as women's studies or feminist theory uh, is multiple. And it's happening and emerging in multiple places all the time. Uh, so it's a little like trying to teach a conversation that's happening among many, many different conversation partners. Uh, and as it's like if you have a whole room and everyone was talking at once, you would be sort of uh, turning people's attention to, now listen to these three and the other conversations are still going on and you're trying to sort of concentrate on what are these three people saying to each other? Uh, and then you sort of turn that volume down and you look over here and you say, okay, now what are these four people saying to each other? And one of these people was actually just came from that conversation over here. Uh, so it's, it, it's really this very fluid thing that gets presented as a solid thing in a book, uh, as a linear thing, because you can only read in one direction. Um, and it can be sort of, um, we have metaphors for understanding uh, what this is already. So lots of people have heard about the waves of feminism, right? So those of you who have been in the class, do you have like a three sentence critique of the waves metaphor? Remember? Well, it's exactly how you did in the readings. The wave is like uh, emerging and then descending, but that is not what is happening to the conversation in feminist theory. Uh, and, and that is why we had a, a reading where they said the kaleidoscope is probably a better metaphor than a wave because constantly the configurations of the uh, interlocutors keeps changing. Um, I guess that's more than three sentences. Yeah. <laughs> that's great. I, I think there was a semicolon, so you <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So so we're all pretty well versed in understanding feminist movement in three waves. First wave, second wave, third wave, and now they're saying actually that we're probably in the midst of the fourth wave emerging. But that narrative forces a way of understanding the movement, um, particularly in terms of this ebbing and flowing. Uh, it pays attention to really noisy moments in the time of feminist movement. Uh, and and uh, says that when the moments aren't noisy, nothing's really happening, right? Actually, loads was happening, but quieter things are happening. Uh, it also continues to privilege a um, 
U.S. narrative on the telling of the story. So mostly it's the U.S. feminist movement that gets, uh, that determines the waves. Um, and then it also ends up continuing to privilege the white, the Euro feminist movement, and tends to depict anything other than that as only emerging in resistance to or in opposition to the white Euro movement. Whereas feminism was emerging in multiple forms, feminism broadly defined, was emerging in multiple forms, in multiple contexts, um, among multiple peoples of different ethnicities, races, and nationalities in the United States and globally. Um, on their own merits, not in any way needing to rely on what white or European women were doing. Uh, so the waves metaphor ends up actually perpetuating that narrative um, rather than sort of releasing it. And it's, uh, I think, the Linda Nicholson article in here who says, the kaleidoscope model um, or metaphor is actually a much more helpful one because it depicts movement all the time. Um, there are shifts that happen. Different things come into the center at different moments. Different things move back out to the margins at different moments. Uh, it's just a much um, it, it's just a much richer way of understanding the movement of feminist theory or the feminist movement. Uh, so. So one of the reasons why I have been using this, this book or the various editions of this book over the years is because it does take both local and global perspectives. Uh, it decenters the white Euro perspective. Um, and it, uh, it doesn't treat the, the global um, parts of feminism as the exotic um, or the ones that are in resistance to uh, the U.S. and white narrative. Um, the second books that we have been reading, um, and choosing your books is all part of your pedagogy, right? Yes. So, so that shapes what people's entry point is to, to the subject. Uh, so I have balanced over the last uh, two years ago, I added this book, Faithfully Feminist. Jewish, Christian, and Muslim Feminists on Why We Stay. A collection of uh, first-person memoir narratives written by women uh, about their experiences in uh, religion um, and from multiple different faith perspectives. It was great, uh, but it's all Abrahamic. Uh, religions. So last year at the end of the semester a student of mine who was from the Detroit area told me about this book, Friendship and Faith, The Wisdom of Women Creating Alliances for Peace. Um, and it's uh, put together by this group called Women's Interfaith Solutions for Dialogue and Outreach in Metro Detroit, uh, Wisdom. Who's the author of this book? This is a collection of many different authors, so some of them are here and here. Uh, and also um, a collection of first person narratives of uh, women from multiple faiths, not just uh, Abrahamic related faiths. Uh, and, um, sorry, just hearing Sarah saying Abrahamic and Sarah related faiths. <laughs> I was going to, she was like, shh, but no. She's like, no, you need to say my name. <laughs> so, uh, so this one, one of the reasons why I included this one, not only because it's more representative from um, more faiths that are present here at the GTU and not, uh, but because this is an account of women who are working together across difference. Uh, in the last couple of years, teaching women's studies and religion, um, particularly beginning with last year's class, there was a different feeling of urgency in the classroom about how are we uh, going to do this work 
Um, and how can we um, connect with one another, acknowledging difference, but not fragmenting because of it. Um, and there was almost a sense of impatience with some of the theoretical pieces that had been written even in recent years, but prior to 2016, uh, that kind of had a luxury in theolo the theoretical reflection on difference. Uh, whereas in the class, there was this intense urgency of we need to figure out how to build coalitions uh, in the midst of difference in a way that won't perpetuate harm but also will acknowledge that harm will be done, so how will we, how will we deal with one another when it is done? Uh, because we're gonna make mistakes, but we can't, we don't have the luxury of not engaging on that level. Um, so so this, this piece is uh, written by people who were um, connecting with one another um, across differences. Um, yeah. yeah. So how have you, and maybe you're going to get to this, so sorry, no, 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 but do you, do, um, do you share like one week you'll focus on one of them versus another, like kind of optional, or how do you yeah. balance that? And like, how have you found that book to be since yep. you introduced it? So this is probably the part that I'm least satisfied with um, for the class, that mostly these end up being background reading. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, <coughs> And that we end up, because the theory is so dense, um, we really need to unpack that theory. And we spend most of our time grappling with that in some way. And, and these pieces just sort of form um, conversation partners uh, for students. And I, I don't know if those who have been in this year's class, I mean, I think you would agree. But I'm wondering, has there been another aspect of it that you noticed. Yeah. It's not super integrated. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so trying to figure out how to do that. Now, in an, uh, one year, I had a student use uh, this, this one to write her own memoir. Mm -hmm. um, so it can be, and we'll talk briefly, or talk a little bit, in a little bit, about the final projects um, that people are able to do. So there's a lot of freedom there, and she decided to move in the direction of, of writing her memoir based on, and for her talking about why she stayed, and also what she left. So, yeah. Loka, Lisa. Any other questions on the sources or the readings? All right, um, so the other thing I wanted to point to um, is just briefly on the top of page three, uh, under assigned readings, there's a paragraph there um, that uh, actually comes from when Professor Sharon Fenema and I uh, were both doctoral students at the GTU, <coughs> and we taught um, a new hawk course together. And we crafted uh, three of these, and then later, um, along with uh, Dr. Margaret McManus, who um, is a colleague of mine at ABSW, we added a fourth one. Um, so I just want to highlight this because it has to do with pedagogy as well. And maybe um, I'll just read it real quickly. You're expected to prepare for each class by completing the assigned readings. I hope that you will engage these readings with a variety of critical hermeneutical approaches, namely generosity, an empathetic reading of the text, attempting to inhabit the world of the author and understand the arguments from that point of view, open-minded engagement, noting the sound and compelling aspects of the author's work, suspicion, noting elements of the language, analysis, sources, that may indicate blind spots in the author's analysis. Embodiment and experience, remembering you are a body reading, 
taking breaks as needed, noticing bodily responses, and relating your own experience in strategic ways to the text. And then suggestive critique, commenting on incorrect or inadequate elements of the author's arguments and offering suggestions for changes. So I've found that it's helpful to sort of name those approaches to the text because I think students tend to have a natural tendency toward maybe one of those. Um, some students are great at a hermeneutic of generosity. I was like that when I was an MDiv student. Everything I read, I loved and I agreed with it. <laughs> I love a beautiful argument. Um, and I, it makes me swoon and the next thing I know, I, I think that's who I am. And then I read the next one and I'm, and I'm just swept up into it. And I had no idea until I show up at class that actually they really disagree with each other. <laughs> Two very different perspectives. So I was great at generosity. Some people are great at suspicion, right? They're able to just immediately see what is missing um, and, and can't can't quite place themselves in the shoes of the author um, and, can, and can really distrust that the author has even ever been done any work. Like, do they even know what they're talking about? How, how dare they say this? You know, how could they be so clueless? Um, and, and find it just a little bit more difficult to sort of have a sense of generosity. Um, toward the person who's writing. Um, so, uh, so just kind of helping people identify these different approaches um, and then using that to, when needed to sort of gently say, you're doing great at generosity, um, but you need a little more suspicion here. You're doing great at suspicion. You need a little more generosity. Um, the embodiment and experience one is one that I added later, uh, reminding people that they are bodies. Um, and that our bodies are involved in our reading. Um, that reading is an embodied activity. And how many times have we been sitting in the same chair, in the same position for hours and hours and hours, uh, and we haven't eaten, um, or we're, we're reading through our sleep, um, and there's, there can be something transcendent in that experience, uh, but it, it's not always good for yes. the body, um, and it's not always good for the mind. So just to, to remind people that it's okay to know that you are a body reading, you need to know that, um, and that it might be better for you to read less and comprehend more and take care of yourself while you're doing your work. Um, so, kind of with that in mind, skipping over to page five, um, and I wonder if someone who has a uh, syllabus would read that paragraph under extra credit. Allowed. Practices of health and self care, students are able to receive three points of extra credit per month. You may do so each month by A, attending a woman centered event or activity. WSR sponsored events count towards this. Meetup.com is also a neat website to find out about events in your area. Or B, engaging in self care activity to be determined by you. <laughs> Examples of self care activities might be getting a massage, going for a walk, mm -hmm. taking a nap. Mm -hmm. Practicing a Sabbath day, unplugging from electronic and social media for a day or weekend, painting, writing poetry, singing in a choir. To receive extra credit, please submit an email or text a photo to me <laughs> if you at the event are doing the activity. As appropriate, use your discretion. <laughs> <laughs> One event slash activity per month is worth three points. Please submit your extra credit within the month you have done it. Please do do not submit all four extra credit activities at the end of the semester. <laughs> so 
so why? Why why would I do that? I'm thinking about Elizabeth Johnson's notion of the radical act of self care mm -hmm. um, as like kind of inherently part of um, the misengagement in the world. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that when we're told that we need to be all the things and do all the things um, to kind of say, no, mm -hmm. I'm going to care for myself in these particular ways mm -hmm. is a radical act. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And for me, one thing that was heartening within the classroom was that people would, again, as they want to, uh, brought up those practices or brought up um, those events and what was helpful about that is learning from one another and learning of what feeds people mm -hmm. um, and perhaps getting an idea from someone else. So I thought that was a, a great way and a very hard way. And it keeps accountability as well. Like this work is challenging and we're bodies that are reading and this takes a toll. And it's not just this, but it's everything else. And so how to proceed um, knowing that there is a sense of urgency. Yeah. Mm -hmm. For me, I used to spend once a week time with the uh, homeless people. Mm -hmm. And that was really a kind of a, to contextualize what I study and mm -hmm. to become much more human, to understand the pains of others, not only to focus on my own, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, my study should open a door to reach out to others. Yeah. Activities are embodied experiences too. So kind of going along with the sense of like you are a body reading, mm -hmm. but then also like you are a body that can learn through other modalities. Mm -hmm. um, and I see that emphasized mm -hmm. yeah, in that practice. Yeah. Yeah. Right. It seems like it also gets us out of like the holy hill bubble. Mm -hmm. Like out into the community and the conversations with people who aren't affiliated with the GTU. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Also, I think a lot of feminist theory has to do with the female body experiences. Mm -hmm. So um, I think it's actually helping you to connect to the readings as well and to the theorizing of female experiences. So mm -hmm. um, that, that's what I felt. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and it's hard work, like I was saying at the very beginning, um, engaging in this this work is hard, and uh, there are things that are energizing about it, but it's also draining. Mm -hmm. um, and if we're going to be in it for the long haul, and my hope is that people taking this class are going to be in it for the long haul, um, we need to incorporate these practices of self-care uh, into our daily existence, our weekly existence. We can't just keep pushing. <coughs> we have to stop sometimes. And I don't think we talk about that enough as academics. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I put in my syllabus. Yeah. That was another thing. Last year it wasn't in the syllabus because it occurred to me on my drive in on the first day of class. Mm -hmm. uh, and I thought, huh, I'm going to give extra credit for self-care. Um, so the following year I was able to, which was, you know, I needed about a year to figure out points and all that kind of thing. It does not come naturally to me. Um, backing up, uh, looking at the um, final project. Um, this is another way I try to employ some, uh, I think of this as feminist pedagogy uh, because it's it's learner-centered and um, valuing what people bring into the classroom and what questions are driving them um, and what the work is that they feel that they most need to do. So um, I work in this flexibility for the final project where students are able to do an academic paper, an extensive reading, a professional project, or <coughs> if they haven't seen anything already there, another project idea um, that occurs to them. Um, and so this is one of the reasons why one of my students was able to do her final um, paper in, in the form of poetry um, with these lovely footnotes. Um, and uh, uh, I've had a student design a course that uh, then became a Newhall course. 
Um, I've had uh, a student, a student this year is, um, she has in the past done um, like rites of passage for girls and women. Um, but uh, this year she is modifying how she offers that because she's um, going to begin um, offering the, her workshops in prisons. Mm -hmm. And the course has alerted her to resources that she's realized that she needs to um, start to incorporate into her workshops. Um, uh, so lots of different ways. I had one student do an extensive reading project on science fiction, uh, women science fiction authors, uh, and the ways that they construct the world, their worlds, um, because science fiction is a world constructing um, uh, genre. Uh, and reading a bunch of the different science fiction and just writing notes about what she's noticing about that. Um, this year I have one student who presented last week on uh, the uh, Iranian diaspora uh, and uh, looking at um, Iranian um, feminists, uh, poetry, um, and, uh, and diaspora writings in the United States. So, um, it provides for uh, a richness that happens at the end of the class um, that people incorporate the directions that they want to take the material. Um, so, yeah. And there are others in the class who, um, who are actually, do any of you want to kind of say briefly what your final projects are going to be this year? You don't have to, but. <laughs> Yeah, sure, I can say that I just did sort of um, like women's economic practices and how those relate to my research around Christian stewardship. Mm -hmm. Brianna, do you? Uh, I'm, doing an, I'm doing an art project mm -hmm. making like paper snowflake cutouts of female figures and kind of using the symmetry in there and moving away from symmetry to represent intersectional feminism, mm -hmm. like moving from white feminism where one part is equal to the other to one where unique experiences are honored. Mm -hmm. I'm really excited for it. I'm yeah. it tomorrow. <laughs> it's super fun. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, I'm, I'm uh, designing a five day spiritual retreat course where I'm uh, incorporating some of the readings from the Faithfully Feminist mm -hmm. and some of the consciousness raising uh, activities and of course the poetry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Karen, do you want to say what you did? Do you remember what you did for your present? Yeah, yeah um, I, I did an extensive reading project which was great just to get the chance to engage with texts that I had heard a lot about but had never read in necessarily like a classroom setting. So I read um, and Sean Copeland, um, I read um, Elizabeth Johnson, um, oh, I can't remember the third yeah. author now. Um, the two. Um, no, I I don't know that. But, but books that like I think just helped to ground some of the learning that I was experiencing in like other class classrooms and like but grounding in more like a feminist Catholic theologians mm -hmm. and that'd be subtle. It's not subtle. Yeah. But, but these these big works that I've heard of um, uh, that now except for now the third one that I can't remember on my head but, um, but that I can kind of reference and, and incorporate into other yeah. 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 Was it Ada Maria Sassi Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes, that's where I was. Yeah. Cool. And do you want to talk about yours? Sure. Um, so I made a podcast, which I had never done before. Um, I recommend doing it, but it does take a long time. <laughs> uh, and for me, one of the goals in the project was to engage in a different modality that would be helpful to me like professionally in the future. Mm -hmm. So even though, again, I'm an expert by no means, it just gave me like a little bit of an idea of how that creative process would work. Um, and it was helpful to, you were kind of talking about what are the questions that are driving you. Um, and kind of in looking back, I can see that the decision, like the, the theme of it, to reflect on uh, basically the final project of another course on Ignatian spirituality and uh, women who had taken vows as Jesus in the first uh, couple decades of the Society of Jesus and how those stories aren't told. Mm -hmm. um, so it was this interesting kind of 
move across of one class to another. And again, because those questions that continue to be raised. So it was a cool process regardless of the product, I think, which is I in which was is indicative of the it's like the point. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so yeah. And Dina, do you want to talk about yours? I did my research paper, which you called to do to my dissertation. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. It is about, um, I incorporated Asian feminist studies also. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Good. Yeah, so, um, so it just, it, that opening up the, the end of um, the class to these different projects uh, has um, been, I think, a great way that students have been able to be engaged throughout. Uh, and then also, as part of that, um, encouraging students, when they do their presentations, to present a work in progress. Um, and I talk with students about this as well, that often in academic settings, um, we present completed vaults uh, at conferences and so on. You know, you, you present what you have figured out and what you have done. And what that does is it obscures the struggle um, that we all go through to get there. Um, and we end up sort of all suffering at some moments on our own. Uh, whereas if we are intentional about sharing works in progress, and this is something that I got from my own dissertation director, Andrea Bieler, when she taught at PSR, um, when we share our own works in progress, we, there are more openings for engagement, um, and there's also a sense of, um, uh, of being honest about where we're struggling, which means that we feel less anxiety when we ourselves struggle, when someone else says, this is where I'm really trying to trying to figure this out, I don't understand this, I'm stuck here, I'm worried about this. Uh, so, um, so I encourage students to present their, their works before they're completed um, in order to let people engage them at various, at a, at a different stage. All right, I'll get my notes here. Um, uh, Maybe our main paper better be focused on women, but uh, we can incorporate this dimension in that. My doctoral uh, paper was based on the contemplative property spirituality of Thomas Merton. Mm. But uh, in that dimension, what I have, uh, I have taken to the fifth chapter in dialogue with the Indian context, mm -hmm. and there we can see it is India is a patriarchal society, mm -hmm. and uh, it is a male-dominated church. And how so much more to encourage the contemplative nuns uh, uh, to stand their own feet and to confront the church for the good of the church. Mm -hmm. I think that, that was uh, giving me a lot of opening for the Indian context to take this as a kind of home. It was a beautiful, encouraging experience to have a deeper study of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. Um, Maybe just another piece that I, I want to lift up is um, I mentioned in the introduction it was mentioned that um, I am talking about pedagogy because I see the pedagogy in this class as being an integral part of the learning experience for students. Um, and one of the reasons why uh, it is integral is that we start the semester by talking about pedagogy. Um, we, we sort of acknowledge we're in a classroom together. Um, what are we doing uh, as a class together? I remember Sharon just uh, came in a bit ago and the two of us, um, we, when we were teaching together, we, we both learned from Judith Burling, who was here and amazing. Um, and I remember Sharon and I having conversations when we were doctoral students saying, can't we just say in the classroom this is a classroom, and we're doing 
doing, pedagogy. Yeah. Um, and like, do we have to just kind of figure out our pedagogy and then just do it, but never tell anybody that that's what we're doing? Um, and I remember we, I think the first time we were we taught, we had um, two sessions that we called pulling back the curtain, or maybe that was the first time I taught the WSR class. I had it. I said pulling back the curtain. Um, and, and that was the way I thought of those first classes, that let's pull back the curtain, see what the workings are that went into developing this class, um, what my commitments are as a teacher in this room, and what I hope you'll take on as your commitments as students in this room. Um, yeah? Good question. Um, in that wondrous opening session, did you invite the students to actually, in some sense, to some degree, shape pedagogy for the class? Yeah, definitely. So in a couple different ways. Um, one year, uh, working mostly from this syllabus, one of my requirements was that everybody posted a Moodle response and everybody responded to everybody's Moodle response. Or maybe it was two. And the end of that night, that was no longer the requirement. Um, the student said to me, this is, this is not possible. Um, and uh, it just, this feels awful to me. And I said, okay, let's get rid of it. Um, and it was like, like they were shocked. <laughs> um, they couldn't believe that I just took that and said, all right, let's take this out. What, you know, what does feel reasonable to you? Um, when do you think we should check back in about this? Um, I'll have the new syllabus posted. Um, so in that sense, it was a really like specific um, feedback that said, this, we need to change the course in this way. Um, Another way is that the students, um, after about the third week, the students are the ones who lead the discussion. Um, and, uh, and they run with it. So the students really teach this course uh, to one another. Um, and the pedagogy shifts for each student, but I do emphasize and model those first few weeks a highly participatory um, way of teaching. And I, I do say to the students, I don't want this, in this way I'm imposing power, right? I don't want you to lecture. Um, I, I want you to design a, a session that is going to have people involved in discussion. Um, I'm not expecting you to read this and be the expert on it and tell us what it means. I'm expecting you to read it look at people's Moodle responses, get a sense of where the questions are that are emerging, um, and lead us into a discussion about it. And the students do amazingly <coughs> creative things. Like when um, Vasily, I, I forgot to ask you to talk about your final project, but when you led your class session for us, the topic was this really heavy theoretical stuff on solidarity. Um, and it was the last session of the semester. And uh, that city had us come into, we moved, we would move into a different space, um, into the sort of student lounge area where we could get up and move around, and you had us sing. Um, but not a song, right? You just said, you're an orchestra. Um, <clears throat> and there's a rhythm section, and there are other instruments. Um, go. It was, that was just about the, that was just about it for instructions. Um, and a couple people started to sing an actual song. A couple people started to do a rhythm piece. Uh, a couple people started to just kind of make sounds that started to fit in more or less. Um, there was lots of laughter. And then we used that to reflect on um, what does solidarity look like? Mm -hmm. um, and what can the role of something like singing together, um, how can that create a sense of connection uh, that, that otherwise 
you might miss if you're just staying up here all the time. Mm -hmm. And I swear, I don't think we delved into a single one of those articles, but we all talked afterwards about how we understood what we read so much better mm -hmm. than had we wrestled with all of those ridiculously big words that were <laughs> in that, those essays. Mm -hmm. So those, that's a way that the, that the students um, shape the classroom experience mm -hmm. in a huge way. Anyone else have, like, who's been there have anything to add about student shaping the This year, I was in India for the first three weeks of class, which was the most unusual way to start a class that I've ever done. Um, and I recorded a video uh, to welcome my students and had um, two different um, professors come in and fill in for me the first three weeks, Amanda Kaminsky and Leslie Bowling dyer um, <clears throat> And I recorded, yeah, I recorded the welcome video so that people could see me the first night. Mm -hmm. And the idea was that that sort of transfers um, kind of the trust and the, um, the, the power in a sense from, I know you're expecting a professor here. I'm, I'm telling you who I am and I'm telling you that this person is trustworthy, um, <laughs> right? So what you didn't see is that when I sat down to record the video, I was in my backyard and uh, I put my chair down. We have gophers in our backyard. <laughs> and I sat down to record it and my chair just tipped right over. Pulling <laughs> 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 back the <laughs> uh, And then maybe the, maybe the last piece that I'll say around pedagogy is, um, I, I have make sure that the room is set up in um, a configuration that is non-hierarchical. Mm -hmm. um, and even at ABSW, uh, we're often in a U, which is almost a circle. Mm -hmm. right? So at least we're not in rows. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but a U is still really foregrounding the professor um, and sets the literally sets the professor apart from the rest of the class. Um, but in the women's studies and religion class, I make sure that the tables are set up in as small a circle as we can have for the number of students that are there, so that we're not seated way across the room from each other, uh, and that there is no head of the classroom. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then I will sit in different places, mm -hmm. um, not, and I don't think I ever sit in what is considered traditionally the head of the classroom mm -hmm. when I teach the class. And I do that in order to subvert assumptions before they can happen. <laughs> right? um, and it's important because I know the students are going to be taking their turns leading the class. And when they are leading the class, I want people to be looking at them, mm -hmm. um, not at me. Mm -hmm. And when people are having discussions, I want them to be looking at each other, mm -hmm. talking with each other, not talking with to me so that other people are overhearing it, mm -hmm. which is often the way discussions go in a classroom. Mm -hmm. um, so that takes extra work. Uh, I'm sure it annoys our facilities people <laughs> because it means that they have to set up the, um, the classroom differently. It challenges me because uh, I hate to annoy the facilities people, <laughs> um, but I make myself do it anyway. It always seems like at some point in the semester, it starts to not happen. So then I need to make sure that I go down early enough that I can move the furniture. Um, so it needs to be, like, for me, it's a strong commitment um, that the shape of the room um, will facilitate the kind of pedagogy that I'm looking for. In a hierarchical setup, how do you believe, uh, for example, in Indian context more of lecturing, mm -hmm. three classrooms, uh, how do we begin? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 I'm really uncomfortable in a, in a classroom with rows. Mm -hmm in it. I, I don't do very well. Yeah. 
So maybe I'll just kind of pause here and see what you, if you have questions or comments or um, insights <coughs> or other experiences to offer. comment to put out there that uh, I felt really refreshed to hear that you were able to ditch the noodle part. Uh, <laughs> as a student who has always wanted to work toward more embodiment, mm -hmm. I find that noodle really works against that sense of embodiment. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you. Mm -hmm. I didn't ditch it all together. So, but I did ditch <laughs> the, um, the added conversation pieces. Mm -hmm. uh, and I have been on the fence about letting it go all together. So students have to write, um, they write uh, responses each week, but they choose four that they submit for grading. And this is something else that Sharon and I did for a new hall. Just kind of letting you know that new halls are great, mm -hmm. right? They really help you sort of practice some of this stuff. And some of the things that I learned and did way back then, I still do now. Mm -hmm. So to have them choose only four. That lets a student choose their best work. Um, and it also lets them, if they want to kind of ramp up, um, then they can do that. It lets, uh, like, Bina knocked out her for, like, the first four weeks of class, <laughs> um, which was brilliant. And then she could kind of, she, her work never slacked, but her, um, but she, it was done. It was out of the way. She didn't have to worry about it anymore. Um, so, so that's that's a, a level of flexibility that I put into it, and I think it does really help students articulate and grapple with the theoretical work and start to put it in their own words and bring their questions to it, which then helps the people who are leading the discussions also know where students are and what kind of, and sometimes helps us understand what the heck an article is about. Um, because sometimes they're just written really confusingly. Mm -hmm. So someone, a student will write it and will go, oh, that's what they're talking about. <laughs> so, yeah. I think I, if I can, yeah. I can, one of the things I've done in my classes is to, to use the voice threads mm -hmm. aspect of Moodle to allow people to speak their responses instead of only type only typing them and that actually has surprisingly to me encouraged people to be a little bit more embodied in how they're responding like I've had a couple of people like start with a song or do something else that is it that's sort of prevented um, in the Moodle um, in the written kind of form of Moodle so just throw that out as another option for like ways to kind of challenge the the uh, limits of the <laughs> system um, because they that actually is a really pretty user friendly um, module. Yeah. So. Yeah. I have in other courses also made VoiceThread available for my weekly journal assignments because I have some students who just say writing I just can't write. It's I'm completely blocked, and I so I've set up a VoiceThread a private VoiceThread for them that they can just go in and just talk to me about it mm -hmm. rather than rather than try to write. And I would encourage you to like ask your professors for that. If you're if Moodle is like if typing Moodle is a thing, like ask for it. Yeah, tell them <laughs> Sharon said. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to say as I'm looking through like the the nuts and bolts of each week of the syllabus, um, one of the things that I really love is not only like meeting with all those and marking off the um, but also giving time to go back right. and offer the deepening insights. Like that's one thing that I'm really um, appreciating about like an intentional start yeah. um, to the semester um, because I, I feel like it's echoing um, the intention of we will continue to learn and grow from these readings. Like yeah. they're not just like a one-stop shop, right? Exactly. I mean, it's this thing um, that that we grow from and learn from ongoingly. Um, so I, I want to steal it. <laughs> yeah, yes, thank you so much for lifting that up because, yeah. yeah, that is a really important part for the beginning of the of the class. Um, and in my constructive theology class, I do a whole thing around it. Mm -hmm. And it's fun, sometimes I'll have a student in the class who's from constructive theology and then I have that student explain why we're rereading so that I don't have to explain it. <laughs> um, but I think a lot of academia uses a consumerist model for reading. So you read as much as you can, 
mm -hmm. um, as fast as you can. So it's amount and efficiency that are valued above all. You read to master the material, um, and then it's disposable. Like literally, sometimes you you throw it away after you're done reading it. Um, but but even if you don't actually throw it away, you never go back to it. Um, so uh, a different, and I think that shapes us. That shapes our souls. It shapes um, our understanding because practices shape you. Um, and that's what we are practicing over and over and over again is this consumerist way of reading. So what if we reread um, and we return to the material and, um, and uh, particularly with those two articles, um, students will uh, might have a high level of resistance to something that they read the first time. Then we discuss it as a class. Then they reread it and rewrite about it. And invariably, there are at least a few students who say, yeah, I totally um, misheard the first time. This is what I'm seeing now. Um, and so they really see the value of returning to the material. Um, the other piece about students shaping the pedagogy, there's a lot of reading in this course, um, which could start to do the consumerist model, I tell students, they don't take me up on it as often as you would think that they would, but I say, you're leading class next week. If there's a particular article that you want us to concentrate on, tell us that. We can read that one and the others we may not, you may not have to deal with. Um, so there's a choice for students throughout the semester to say, I know there are six articles assigned this week, I think we should just read two. Mm -hmm. um, that's possible. Other questions? Yeah. I think if you want to phrase this, um, I sometimes there's a tension for me as a student in classes where there's a lot of other student leadership, um, and people have a variety of backgrounds and a variety of sets of experiences that they bring to the table and a variety of sort of modes of engagement. Um, and sometimes people come to lead things and the class is taken up by an engagement with something that seems like like it didn't get to the heart of it in some way. Or um, particularly in a, in a class like this class, which has a diverse set of students from a diverse set of academic backgrounds, um, and I mean, this is this is something that isn't happening so much to me at this level, I suppose. But at the end of when I was in that program, really, a lot of times I felt like we somehow this conversation about pedagogy turned into like just let the students share their feelings about whatever the readings were, and and never kind of get to, to like building anything out of it. And so I'm just wondering how. Um, how you navigate that, if that's something that comes up, if that's something that you feel like is is a factor at play, in, and sort of how to hold the tension between wanting people to take ownership of their learning and bring their experiences to the table, which I'm 100% behind, and um, also wanting people to kind of walk away with the with the sort of best collective wisdom about something and not just what they had in their pocket originally bringing to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's risky business. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of a quick answer. <laughs> um, a couple different things. The, the student is responsible for 45 minutes. So it's a longer class session than that which allows for cleanup, if necessary, in the latter part of class. Um, that's, that's one piece. Um, I think there also is value, and others might disagree with me. I'm sure others would disagree. <laughs> um, that I think that there is value in um, in the cumulative effect. 
So any one session may not have hit the mark or be, be that great, or we may have missed what I think were some really key things that we could have benefited from learning. Um, but the process of being in it with one another um, has value in and of itself. Um, and I think sort of a paired with that is um, we want to help each other do well uh, and kind of commit at the beginning of the class to help each other do well. So people, if something is going a little off the rails, I have noticed more often than not a tendency for the class itself to self-correct, um, to, to gently bring it back to, I've been, I, I've been thinking about this part of the argument or something like that. Um, but I do think, and I'm sure that there are times when students have left the class going, yeah, that just didn't, that just didn't work for me, or I'm finding it really frustrating that I'm reading this really hard theory, but all we did was create an orchestra in the student lounge, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, um, so I think there's a, there's sort of a, a diversity of experiences of that, mm -hmm. but it is risky, yeah. Yeah, no, I really want to echo the idea that those emotive experiences are important. Mm -hmm. And I think one like strategy as an instructor to balance that is to be like, thank you so much for your, for that reflection. Um, can you spell out for us how you see that connected to this particular theory or this aspect of the reading? So it's not like demeaning that reflective emotive piece, but at the same time is saying like, let's think together about how this relates um, to this theory, so that the theory has a place to land and kind of situate in someone's experience. Yeah. Um, like I've seen, like my advisor does that really beautifully, um, and it's a tool that he's kind of passed on um, through um, my experience at the New Hall with Lauren, who has um, graduated since. But yeah. Um, but yeah, like I've seen it work. Is what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. yeah. That's great. And I think another thing that helped was in the beginning of the course. Uh, I mean, probably predicting that this is what is going to happen, that sometimes there is uh, one or a few particular students who will just run away with the argument or will have the most to share. Uh, so I remember being cognizant or being reminded that uh, the importance of stepping up and then stepping away. Mm -hmm. uh, I think this was echoed, resonated uh, a couple of times in the beginning of our class, the, the importance to this, like step up and then step away. Mm -hmm. uh, being cognizant of that, I think, helps to keep that in mm -hmm. Yeah, great. Thanks. Yeah, please. I was thinking about what you were saying about the arrangement of the room, and one of the things I found myself really struggling with is the fact that I do hold power. Mm -hmm. and, and, like, as much as I want it to be flat, it's not. No. Mm -hmm. And so how do I responsibly embody that power mm -hmm. when I'm trying to create a non-hierarchical situation. Like what's the what are strategies for like negotiating the fact that we really do have power as instructors in a different way than other folks mm -hmm. and and to hold like that commitment to to the to the non-hierarchical work, but also to hold accountability to the power that we do have. Mm -hmm. So I'd love to hear you. Just say easy. Oh, right. <laughs> I think about it a lot, and I don't ever, I am never under the illusion that I don't hold the most power in the room. Mm -hmm. um, and even in this situation, like the very first thing, handing out the the um, poetry exercise and saying, here, do this for five minutes. Mm -hmm. That is an exercise of major power. Um, I try to exercise my power in a way that is um, intended to draw others out and in, um, rather than to exercise it in a way that asserts my myself forward mm -hmm. 
Um, and I, I don't know if that's too nonspecific, but that's, that's one way that, that I try to do that. Um, I'm often negotiating with students one-on-one -on -one mm -hmm. around assignments that aren't done um, or uh, things that aren't happening. So I'm having conversations with students all the time and negotiating those things which are fraught with power as well. Mm -hmm. Um, but I also try, even in that situation, to um, have the student's well-being as I can perceive it in primary, as my primary goal. Mm -hmm. So if I have the sense that the assignment that I've crafted for everybody else is not going to work for that student, then I try to use my power to say it doesn't have to be that way. Mm -hmm. um, and they're like offering a voice thread way of engaging a journal rather than a written way. I have the power to say, I know the syllabus says this, but in conversation with you, I understand what you're saying is that is not helpful for you right now. Let's find what's helpful so that you can succeed mm -hmm. um, without lowering the standard, but shifting the approach, basically. Mm -hmm. So I think I try to use power in that way, yeah. Dr. Mount's trouble. Uh, Dr. Davidson, could you speak to the fact I'm hearing you, your style is to have a lot of pedagogical democracy mm -hmm. in, in, the, in the class and the input of the students. What happens or have you found that um, some of the students, um, male and or female, uh, read that incorrectly and therefore try to take advantage of that, mm -hmm. of your pedagogical democracy, uh -huh. thinking that it's, that you're a pushover <laughs> or too easy. You, you understand what I'm saying? And therefore yep. they, instead of appreciating and taking advantage to deepen a learning experience, tailor a learning experience, they end up thinking they can yeah. get away with less. Right. Um, well, I might be a pushover sometimes. <laughs> like, that's one place that I have struggled, I think, in my career. I tend to trust people and what they're telling me. Um, so I just want to sort of acknowledge that, that there, that there are probably moments when I have messed up um, and trusted too much. I don't, it has been very, very rare for me, and now I'm not talking about women's studies and religion, but in teaching in general, very rare for me to experience what they call classroom incivilities. Mm -hmm. um, the, the few times, the one time in particular that I can think of where someone was really actively resisting me and my style of teaching, it took me a whole semester to figure out what was going on mm -hmm. and then additional reflection in the months afterwards mm -hmm. to unpack it. Um, and, and I just, I say that because I, for me, I've now been at ABSW finishing up, I, 10 years, 11 years, I don't know how to count it. Because um, it goes over, like, you start at one year and you go to the next. So it's <laughs> impossible math. Um, but uh, I say that because over, let's say, 10 years, I'm realizing that I'm, like, it takes time. And teaching takes time. And sometimes, just like I have students who a couple years later will come back and say, oh, now I get what you were saying. Yeah. Um, I also feel like as a teacher, a couple years later, I'll look back and go, oh, I know what's going on there. Mm -hmm. um, and I also, early on, had to get over my own, and this is why teachers should always be in therapy also, <laughs> um, my own <laughs> desire to be liked. Mm -hmm. um, and how much of my pedagogy started to emerge out of, I want everybody to like me. Um, <laughs> And that is not a healthy place to teach from. Yeah. So I've had to get better, and I'm sure there are times that I still fail in that, where I get 
too flexible because I want I just want to be liked mm -hmm. um, and that's my own work that I have to do as a, as a teacher mm -hmm. yeah. well, I feel like Valerie to, to follow up on that too part of my question about the power thing is also around what power gets afforded me as a woman as a queer woman um, and I imagine this is true for others around race and mm -hmm. that there is there's often a power struggle that's involved in teaching so mm -hmm. For, like that that negotiation isn't only about how do I uh, how am I accountable to the power that I have but also how do I negotiate the fact that there are some people who don't want to afford me power yeah. Yeah. in that mm -hmm. and and how how do I still hold on to the hierarchical or the non hierarchical uh, motivation that I have mm -hmm. when there are moments where I might need to claim a space yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. and claim that authority in a way um, mm -hmm that I hear is sort of a kind of It helps to be a badass. <laughs> um, I, I don't think I necessarily come across as a badass, but I can be a badass. <laughs> uh -huh. okay, I'm like, that's okay. <laughs> when we used the um, epistle. So this had no form except it was to be a letter. Uh, and the, the author is anonymous. It's Dear X, to say that you are a lover of poetry is to assert that you can find a meaning in filament, filament, filament. To claim knowledge of the purpose of the red wheelbarrow. To appreciate when an isolated and private woman's words are posthumously the standard of domestic verse. To embrace the pattern of the spoken word piece. Mm -hmm. Dear X, it's to be okay with a friend writing into their poem that they don't understand people who do not understand poetry. <laughs> In other words, to write into their poem words that you spoke to them about how you do not like poems. <laughs> Dear X, I say to you that it might be okay if you don't understand poetry, but I challenge you not to miss out on the continuous wrestling with words that so many others play on and on and on. Jump into the right even though it be messy. The beauty that you find in the messiness, who knows, it might inspire you to write poetry. <laughs> 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 